Now for tonight's presentation, Special Birds of Mount Rainier, presented by Jeff Antonellis Lapp. To most birders, Mount Rainier National Park is a mecca for subalpine and alpine birds that include Canada, formerly the gray jay, Clark's nutcracker, mountain bluebird, and highly sought after specialties that include boreal owl, white-tailed ptarmigan, and gray crown rosy finch. But did you know that it and its neighboring watersheds host northern spotted owl, marvel murrelet, and streaked horn lark, all protected under the U.S. Endangered Species Act? Jeff, emeritus faculty at the Evergreen State College, will share the status of these key species from Tahoma and its people, his natural history of Mount Rainier. Jeff began writing Tahoma and its people after being unable to find a current natural history for a course he planned to teach at Evergreen. He conducted over 250 days of field work for the book, most in the company of park archeologists, biologists, and geologists. Jeff's connection to Mount Rainier began much earlier. After graduating from college, Jeff worked two summers at the mountain, igniting a connection to it that endures today. He has summited it, hiked all of its mapped trails, and completed the 93-mile Wonderland Trail five times. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you, Vicki, and everyone. Thank you, Elaine, for inviting me, and Ed for doing your work. Uh, great work here tonight. Thank you, everybody. Great to be with you. Wonderful. And I feel like I'm home. I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, people I have bumped into in the field birding in years past, and uh, names I see on uh, on tweeters from now and then, and so it's really, really good to be with you. Uh, let's get right to the work at hand, shall we? Uh, so I do have a little bit of uh, a few audio clips uh, for you to hear tonight. Uh, so you might want to make sure that your sound is jacked up, that you can catch those. If you can't hear them, it's not a deal breaker. Okay, but it will just uh, just augment your experience a little bit. So the stories I'm going to tell you tonight, as Vicki said, are uh, from my Natural History of Mount Rainier, a book called Tahoma and Its People that was published by WSU Press in 2020. Uh, you might know that Tahoma is one of uh, several Native American names for the mountain. And if you'd like to know more about that, uh, and I can talk about that and, and possible meanings of the word and other other names for the mountain. Uh, just ask that uh, when we get to the uh, question and answer uh, part of the show at the at the end of the talk. That would be great. But to tonight's talk, uh, I have called. Uh, come on now, here we go. Uh, as you know, tonight's talk is called "Special Birds of Mount Rainier." Well, you know, I could have uh, could have after tonight. After you see the presentation, you could also think that maybe tonight's talk could have been called "Shooting Owls, Kidnapping Eggs, and Birds Flying 100 Miles an Hour," because all of those things are true, and all of those things are talked about in tonight's presentation. But that's a little startling, and I didn't want to like set anybody off at the beginning. So let's just go with special birds of Mount Rainier, shall we? And as we get going, and, and always with a group of birders, who among us doesn't love to bird all the time, right? You walk from the house to the car to do errands, what are you doing? You're looking around, you're seeing what's out. Uh, you're you're uh, at work, You're maybe you're looking out your window, what are you doing? We're birding, right? So let's get warmed up by just giving ourselves a little uh, a, a little easy quiz of some of the common birds of Mount Rainier, just to kind of get ourselves warmed up and in the groove, okay? So I'm going to show you a few images, give you uh, give you a moment to land on uh, the ID of the bird, and then I'll show you uh, show you the identification. Uh, this, of course, one of the corvids, one of the most common corvids at at Mount Rainier, and then the subalpine and and alpine uh, throughout our region. And I'm probably not the only person that still wants to call these gray jays, right? Uh, but uh, recently uh, renamed Canada Jay. So if you guess that, congratulations, you got, you got one under your belt. Uh, so these are just some of the common birds to warm up with. And uh, this is the closest living relative of the black cap chickadee that my wife and I see out our windows at our feeders and our bird baths almost every day. 
And as you probably know, that's a mountain chickadee. And I have to tell a funny one on Elaine, when she saw this slide, she said, uh, Jeff, I think you have a typo there. And the, my response is, well, have you ever heard a chickadee just say chickadee? Usually it's chickadee dee dee or something like that. So uh, mountain chickadee, here's a couple more. This is the one of the earliest returning migrants to come to nest uh, at, at the mountain in the summer. One of the earliest returnees, uh, if it's blue, and if it's a bird, it could be a bluebird. And you're right. Uh, we're, of course, looking at a mountain bluebird. I think this next one has an audio clue first. So see if you can hear this. Pretty low call, and if you couldn't hear that, no worries, here's the audio. I'm sorry, here's the video of it. Isn't that a beauty? This was a, actually one of my student interns at Mount Rainier uh, took this photograph a couple seasons ago. And of course, what we're looking at here is sooty grouse. And those of us that are longtime birders uh, grew up learning these as blue grouse, right? And has since been split into the two species. I believe this is the coastal, the sooty, and then what is it, the interior called dusky grouse. And one more of the super common birds at Mount Rainier, and probably my favorite of the alpine zone. What, what other bird do you know that wears a tuxedo every day, right? So gorgeous. And um, of course, what we have here is another one of the corvids. This is Clark's Nutcracker. And it is uh, conveniently posed in a white bark pine. And uh, you can, there are entire books written on the, the mutualist relationship between white bark pines and Clark's Nutcracker. And uh, I could give an entire talk on just that, that relationship alone. I'd love to talk more about it. And if you'd like to know more, uh, if, if you don't know much, ask a couple questions when we get uh, to the end of the talk and happy to uh, share a little bit more about that. Neat stuff. Well, you probably also know then that besides the more common birds, uh, Mount Rainier and other high spots, but Mount Rainier in particular is a real magnet for birders from outside the region who come to Mount Rainier looking for special target birds. And I'd like to show just a, a few of those to you and let you, uh, let you identify those. This is probably the toughest customer of the bunch when it comes to being able to withstand the harshest environmental conditions. As near as uh, some uh, biologists are concerned, uh, this bird can take it on the chin uh, better than any other when it comes to tough environmental conditions like cold and wind and winter. And of course, what we got is our good friend, the gray crowned Rosie Finch. And I usually see these most every summer. I spend a lot of time on the north side of the mountain. I live in Enumclaw. And so to, to get up to sunrise is just a little over an hour for me. And usually see uh, Rosie Finches on this side of the mountain around snow patches, usually in mm, maybe July, certainly into August. And then on the uh, south side of the mountain at Paradise, usually see them like on the, the uh, on the Paradise Snowfield and on the Muir Snowfield and on the way up to Camp Muir and I have seen them up at Camp Muir as well. Maybe you have too. Uh, this next bird, here you go. One of our favorites, right? And one that could be in a lot of trouble. So what we're looking at here, of course, is uh, one of the chickens, as a, one of my mentors like to say, uh, white-tailed ptarmigan, as, and as he used to, to say of the birds in, in this family, you don't find them, they find you. And sure enough, that's the truth with ptarmigan, and I do not see them every season up at the mountain. And usually it's just a lucky stumble uh, with a hand crossing uh, the trail with a few chicks in tow. And uh, maybe someone here knows more about this than I do. I haven't seen a lot, but there was a little bit in the press about 
uh, uh, the, the population of Mount Rainier might be considered uh, for protection under the Endangered Species Act. I uh, haven't seen anything lately. If anybody knows more about that, you can talk about that when we get to the end. Or if you have links to share, I'd be really, really interested in picking up on any more information about that. And our last uh, target bird that folks uh, often travel miles and miles and miles from across the country to try to hear or to get a look at, here is the uh, audio cue. Here you go. All right, are you ready for that one? The little bugger, there's the visual, and of course, the boreal owl. And many of you surely know that, that the, uh, the, 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 ear, uh, the, the ear positions are on many of the owls are asymmetrical. And we can talk more about that, the way that that helps them echolocate, you know, their prey. The boreal owl, if you ever see a skull of a boreal owl, it is so pronounced. It's amazing how much uh, higher one uh, ear hole is than the other on the, on the skull of a boreal owl. Really interesting stuff. And we can, we can talk more about that, too. I have never seen or heard a boreal owl uh, up at the park. So if you have, uh, good on you. That's pretty awesome. So let's now, we started big with common, we went to some target birds, now let's close in on the really special ones, okay, these three species that Vicki introduced uh, at the beginning of the, of the talk when, when she gave a little overview of tonight's presentation. Uh, first of all, this first bird, I'm going to start with an audio, uh, listen to it, see if you can tell which bird we're going to kick things off with, here it is. Now that's a pretty short call, so let's do a repeat. All right, here's your visual. And here's your multiple choice guesses. Is it A, Woodsy Owl? B, Northern Spotted? C, Great Gray? Or D, Barred Owl? Yes, answer is B, Northern Spotted Owl. And this is the only subspecies of the spotted owl that we have uh, in our region, the northern spotted owl. And those of us that have been at this for a while, we know that these are birds of the deep, dark, mature forests primarily. Um, a single pair of birds uh, can uh, use a, a, a range of about 25,000 acres. Uh, in, in this region, their primary food source, of course, is the northern flying squirrels. And a pair of uh, spotted owls can take uh, in the neighborhood of 500 flying squirrels per year. But they really range far and wide uh, to be able to do that. And you probably also know if you've been in the Northwest for a while and you followed the story, you probably know that it was the decimation of the old growth forests in the 19th and 20th centuries that, that led to a very steep decline uh, in the spot, northern spotted owl populations. And because of that, uh, environmentalists and biologists won a huge victory in 1990 when northern spotted owls were listed as threatened uh, under the Endangered Species Act. It was a pretty big deal. Those of us that remember that know that that was a big deal in the news and, and quite a vociferous opposition, I guess you could say as well. So uh, even since that time and before then, there has been uh, up and down the coast, up and down our, the Western region, a long-term population study that I'd like to uh, talk with you a little bit about and actually invite you to come with me right now on kind of a virtual field trip. We're going to go into the field, but there is a population study that began in the 80s, uh, if I recall correctly, and it's been happening at Mount Rainier for over a couple of decades. So if you want to come with, uh, you're going to need some good sturdy shoes, uh, your day pack with the usual uh, 10 essentials in it, some snacks for sure, uh, rain gear. We're going to be going, we're going to imagine that we're going out uh, July-ish. So we're, we're actually going to be looking, hoping to find birds about this size, young birds of the year that have not yet uh, fledged that are still dependent on their parents. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to traipse through the woods 
uh, near the Longmire area, south side of the mountain. And uh, with the uh, biologists, uh, they're going to carry two things. One is a little plastic container with lab mice, raised uh, lab mice in it that you'll see what we use those for in a moment. And also a, a, an audio playback machine that is going to play uh, digital recordings of northern spotted owl calls. Our goal is walk through the forest and we hope that we end up with a scene like this. We hope that we end up face to face with an adult. This is a, a female northern spotted owl. You'll notice that she is about to bolt down not a deer mouse or another native mouse, but that is a mouse that's been raised in the lab at Longmire. And you'll also notice that she has kind of a, a, a pink and white uh, bracelet on, a ring, if you will, a band on her leg there. And that shows you and me that she has had prior contact with the biologists. And as you'll see some of the other birds in tonight's talk, and most of us know this, that that's one of the ways that biologists can keep track of birds, can keep records when they re-encounter a bird that they had previously uh, netted or captured and had banded, measured, taken measurements of, and then set it free. So our job is to walk through the woods off trail, uh, using the playback machine, listening carefully for northern spotted owls. And when we get a response, we will run like crazy people in the direction of the call. That's what we do. And uh, when we uh, uh, get close enough, if we continue to hear the call, uh, these owls are pretty approachable. And so uh, when we get there and we can find an adult bird in a tree, we will, uh, on a clear area, maybe on a stump, uh, put down one of these lab mice back out of the way and watch. And typically what we hope will happen is the adult bird will come down, uh, snag the prey, bolt it down, eat it, and then go back to a perch with inside of us. And when we lay the second mouse down, we're now poised for more chasing because usually what happens is the adult bird will come down, snag that lab mouse, and start to fly up to where its young are, taking this food to its young. And that's when, again, we just take off like crazy people, running through the woods, careful not to trip over a log or fall in a hole, and to get after uh, the adult bird, hoping that it will lead us to the juvies. And in this case, this day, it's our lucky day. So we have actually found two northern spotted owlets. And uh, you'll see this one, I, you see if, if you can see my laser pointer center of the screen, this one on the branch. And look straight down, you'll see one of the researchers, Keith, has uh, a pole in his hand and his attention is on this bird here. And he's got a little contraption on the end here. He's going to try to uh, basically safely, uh, without harming the bird, noose it, uh, bring it down, and then we're going to take some measurements. And again, these birds are quite approachable, so they seem pretty nonplussed at all this. And on this particular day, uh, you and I got lucky. And uh, these are uh, the two owlets. Here's one of them. Again, you might be able to see the, the new pink uh, bracelet that it's got on. Uh, these birds are banded, they're weighed, they're measured in a variety of ways. And uh, here's its uh, sibling. And then they are set loose. And in this case, uh, they just flew up to a nearby tree and kind of watched us while we finished up uh, making our field notes and uh, eating our morning snacks. So what I think we should do now is take a look at some of the data that this long-term study has, has brought forward. So we're looking at three sites here, one out of the Olympic, one at Mount Rainier, and one in Clay Elm. Uh, when the study began, uh, they called that year zero. That's across this horizon here. So up to about 20 years of the study. And going up the left-hand side, the vertical axis, the population size. So in year one, whatever number of birds they were able to record in each of those locations, they call that 100%. That's what the 100 represents. And if we follow just the Rainier population over the next 10 years, it would be about here, would have been about at 65% of where it was. And then when we get to the 20th year, 
of the study at Mount Rainier, we can see that the population size is only 40% of what it was at the beginning of the study at Mount Rainier. And you can see the Clay Ellen population dropped even more. But at Mount Rainier, about a 60% decline in the surveys of what they were detected as northern spotted owls over that 20 year period. Now, this is a precipitous decline that is happening uh, region-wide throughout the West. Uh, so far as I know, there are no populations of spotted owls that are in great shape or, or that are increasing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But th this is what part of these results have uh, revealed to biologists. And so, obviously, even though the bird has been protected uh, under the ESA, folks were really concerned. And it took the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about eight years of making a very difficult decision. I'm sure there were lots of debates and arguments and lots of hand wringing before uh, they started to land on what, what are we going to do? Can we do anything? Well, and then lo and behold, trying to get to, get to grips with why the decline, what's going on, they knew that uh, loss of old growth habitat was still having an impact. Uh, as, as recently as uh, 2012, there were still uh, 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 over a million, 1.6 million acres of forest habitat uh, for northern spotted owls that we had lost in these three states. So that's still a lot of loss, even despite the Northwest Forest Plan's uh, work. And then here's what they found next was there was another factor that was contributing to the spotted owl's decline, and that was an interloper. Who's that? Who, 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 who cooks for you? None other than the barred owl. The barred owl in this case is kind of a super predator in my opinion. This is a bird that has expanded its range in the last hundred years to include uh, the Pacific Northwest. It was typically an, an Eastern US bird. And there's a couple of different theories on how it moved hopscotched across uh, the continent, but now it's well established in our region. And this is a bird that is uh, highly adaptable to varied habitats. Uh, it has a wet, wide ranging diet, so it can really move into lots of different places. And it also has some reproductive advantages over northern spotted owls in that it has more young more often. And when you factor in that these birds can be up to 20% larger than northern spotted owls, that really spells trouble for the spotted owls. And so a uh, biologist uh, concluded based on the data that they had that the uh, barred owl uh, incursions were really contributing to an added decline uh, and make even significantly worse of the northern spotted owl population. So years and years of hand wringing and worrying and fretting and arguing until they finally, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service finally realized that they were going to try a pilot barred owl removal program and that it that means that uh, birds were going to be shot by biologists and removed from known northern spotted owl habitat so they started with a pilot program in the redwoods in 2013 and as soon as uh, barred owls started to be removed from some of these known spotted owl habitats they found that spotted owls were returning to the habitat that they had been that they had vacated and so uh, the program was expanded uh, to three locations, uh, one in Clay Ellum and two in Oregon, one in the Coast Range and one down in the Klamath. And look at the polygons, the, uh, the, the pinkish or reddish polygons, those are the treatment sections where uh, barred owls were not removed. So the, the biologists were using shotguns in the blue I'm sorry, in the, tree, in, the, in the red areas, the pink ones, that's where they were removing the owls from. And so that they had a baseline of comparison in the blue polygons, there, those were the control areas where there was no removal. Okay, now let's take a look at five years of data after they had removed a couple thousand barred owls from these three locations. Here's a bar graph, and we're going we're gonna to kind of break this down and dig into it. But if we were just to take a look at, say, the Clay Ellen populations, the one closest to us, non-breeding, NB, non-breeding season, 2015 and 16, biologists removed, looks like about 125 barred owls. 
uh, next non-breeding season looks like they took them maybe 75 or 80. In the breeding season 2017, they did not take any out. And you can see on throughout up through 2019, for each of the locations, the number of barred owls that were removed. When we kind of bake that down a little bit, distill that, we can get a look at a closer look at the results of those removals overall uh, in the control areas, and that is where uh, spotted owls uh, w w had not been in and where barred owls were not removed from. From the control areas, spotted owl pairs continued to decline by 83%. But in the treatment areas where barred owls had been removed, spotted owls had actually increased by 12%. So there was some obvious evidence that the removal of the barred owls, as controversial as it is, that it was actually having a positive effect on the resurgence, limited, but nonetheless, of the northern spotted owls. So what does that mean for the future? Uh, well, it's uncertain at this point. Uh, last I heard, Fish and Wildlife Service was prepared to continue the removals, uh, possibly up to about 3,600 uh, owls total. Uh, my understanding is that's a pretty small percentage overall, for what it's worth, a pretty small percentage of barred owls uh, in the region. Uh, but there's also some questions, and that is whether or not uh, the spotted owls might be, get back on the radar and uh, have the listing changed to endangered. Uh, with the ESA, which would afford them more protections probably and more funding for more studies and, and as I said, more protections. So uh, really unclear what the future will hold for uh, the northern spotted owl at Mount Rainier and elsewhere, uh, certainly a bird that is imperiled. And uh, we're going to move now to our second bird and, and another bird that has kind of a, a parallel trajectory, if you will, uh, kind of similar, and let's see if we can dig into that bird now. So here it is on some water. So why don't you uh, take a look at the multiple choice? What do you think this is? Is it A, the great auk? Probably not. B, Casson's auklet? C, marbled murelet? D, pigeon guillemot? And you're right, it's a marbled murelet. Brachyramphus marmoratus. And you might be seeing the bird on the water and saying, hmm, murelets? Mount Rainier, help me with that. Well, I will do that. So I don't know about you, but usually when I see marbled murelets, if I see them at all, they're usually on the water. I usually see them in winter. They're usually at a distance like this, or they're <laughs> flying away from me. Or better yet, they're submerged, they've dove, and they're completely out of sight. And so here's a close-up. I think this is something like a, a, a murelet in the hand is worth two on the water, okay, something like that. So to give you a, a sense of their size, if you're not real familiar with them, these, are the, these birds are about the, about the size and shape of a papaya. Okay, I have it on good authority that they fly much, much, much better than papayas. And although uh, marble murelets uh, were on the diet, were part of the diet and on the menu of a Native American peoples, me personally, I would probably go for a papaya for breakfast instead. But there's some interesting things about the marble murelet. And to me, of the three species that we're honing in on tonight, this is the craziest bird. And I think this will be obvious to you in a few minutes, if it's not already, how the marble murelet has evolved and just so many things that just make it this kind of jaw dropping a bird. And in some ways it's kind of like, well, no wonder they're threatened and they're on the endangered species list. <laughs> They've got some crazy, pretty crazy things going for them. So they are alcids. That puts them as uh, relatives of the, the puffins, uh, the murres, uh, uh, the guillemots, those birds, all right. Uh, did you know that they were the last nest that was discovered in North America? Uh, we knew the location of the whatever it was, 800-ish uh, other nests uh, birds that nest in North America. And in the 1970s, uh, the Audubon Society actually offered a cash reward for the first verified nest of the marble near that. People just didn't really know where this thing nested. Uh, they saw it on, the, on salt water. 
uh, but nobody was really sure down here where they nested. Uh, there was some evidence that they nested. Uh, they were ground nesters uh, way up north, I think in the Aleutians, but down here, uh, people were not really sure where they where they nested at all. So, and it wasn't another four years. It was another four years until a tree surgeon was a couple hundred feet up a dug fir in a state park in California and came face to face with a marbled murelet chick. And that was the first verified nest of the marbled murelet. Pretty wild. Well, let's take a quick look at their range, starting from about central California, if you can see my laser, and then on up uh, Oregon and Washington, up the BC coast, Alaska, and then I said all the way out in the Aleutians where uh, they continue to be quite numerous all the way out. If we zoom in a little bit, we zoom in a little bit to Washington state. So here's the Washington coast. Nia Bay, Cape Flattery, okay, Strait of Juan de Fuca. These little dots all represent breeding season occurrences where marble murelets have been recorded in Washington state. Well, a bird that you and I see on saltwater, we would imagine them to be seen and recorded quite a bit along here, right? That would make all the sense in the world. But how about these inland occurrences? What's going on with these? What's look at it looks like they're in the Cascades. What 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 what's going on? Here's here's the Mount Rainier area. For Pete's sakes, and this is one of the crazy things with marble murelets is that they are one of the few or maybe one of the only uh, alcids that nests in old growth forests. Well, that's that's the truth. What the heck? How can that even be? Well, let's take a closer look. Um, here is uh, uh, single marble murelet egg, uh, and the, the nest, such as it is, is usually like this, kind of a hollowed out depression uh, in a large uh, branch. And in this region, in this area, they tend to nest in dug firs, uh, most of the way up a tree, usually a big dug fir, two thirds or, or more up the tree. So maybe 100, 150, 200 feet up a tree. Uh, the, starting as early as March, uh, the marble murelets, uh, the female lays one egg, and the parents uh, trade incubation duties for about the next month. They incubate, they incubate the egg for about 27, 28 days. And how they do that is uh, they take turns, and uh, they work 24-hour shifts. So one bird is on the egg. Uh, for an entire day while the other bird uh, is off feeding on, on the salt water. And then usually they uh, switch roles uh, at first light, early dawn. And so this is a bird that is um, pretty well hidden, right? Uh, camouflaged, very cryptically colored. Uh, this is also a solitary nester. Um, and these birds can fly remarkably fast. They have been clocked averaging between 45 and 85 miles an hour. And the speed demons have even been clocked at, able to fly at 100 miles per hour. Marble mirror, that's 100 miles an hour. Well, as it turns out, that comes in pretty darn handy because at Mount Rainier, the best location to search for these birds, and of course, I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment, the best location and where we have the most, uh, the most recorded uh, observations of marbled murelets is up in the Carbon River area. And up up near up the Carbon River Road a piece at a place called Falls Creek. And uh, I was uh, given some data by the Park Service that indicated that they had uh, had some luck detecting our marbled murelets up there. So I made it my business to start getting up at two o'clock in the morning from Enumclaw and to get up the Carbon River Road by first light in the summer. Uh, now it's a uh, late June, July, and uh, and to see if I could uh, just prove for myself that marble murelets were up in that region of the park. So as I said, uh, pretty well hidden, super fast flyers. They're only active in uh, low light. That's when they're coming up uh, in the morning uh, to trade off their incubation duties. And once the uh, once the bird hatches, then both parents jump into, fly into action, I should say, feeding the bird, uh, 
pretty much constantly really fast growing chick it's born precocial and it's got a lot of energetic needs and so uh, the parent birds are making trips anywhere from one to eight trips a day from uh, the nest site in, in, in this case if I if I could say probably are nesting we have no proof we don't have any visual proof no confirmations of nest sites within Mount Rainier National Park but we have plenty of detections that the birds are there and we'll get to that in just a second how do you how do you tell it's a mirror when it's dark they're fast and they're really hard to see even this one here it's on the nest you can see it's pretty well hidden if you need a helper here is the murrelet. So once the once the chick hatches, the parents spend their time flying up and down from the nest site. And if they're nesting at Falls Creek on the Carbon River uh, at Mount Rainier, that's about 47 miles from Puget Sound. So round trip, 94 miles. So one bird, one feeding trip, coming back from the Puget Sound with one fish, a sand lance, a, an anchovy, a, 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 a a hair, Pacific herring, one fish crossways in its bill. I, I kind of imagine it like a, like a, you know, crossways, kind of like a, I don't know, a, a fish man chew or something like that, right? One fish feeds the young bird, turns around and flies back to Puget Sound to continue fishing, making up to, as I said, up to eight trips a day, biologists have recorded. That means a single bird could fly hundreds of miles in a single day. So it's dark, they're fast, you can't see them. How do we even detect? How do we even know these birds are up there? You're right. We listen for them. And here's what we listen for. Listen. See if you can hear. It's almost gull-like. It's a keer. See if you can hear it here. So that's the sound I'm listening for when I go up the Carbon River to try to detect marble murelets. The action is at first light when either the egg hasn't uh, hatched yet and the parents are trading off and they're using the calls to locate and find each other, or they're coming into and they're making feeding runs in early in the morning. Have to be careful because there are common nighthawks on the river at that time of day sometimes too. And so I have to be careful not to confuse the nighthawks as I I just imitated as a beer, beer. Have to make sure that I'm listening for the cure of the marble murelet. So despite all these uh, great evolutionary protective devices as I've been talking about, still predation is a pretty big deal. Uh, in fact, uh, over 75% of the nest failures. So three fourths of the nest failures of marble murelets is due to predation. Um, up to, I think it's maybe up to 20 different species of critters prey on marble murelet eggs and the adults. Uh, the corvids are probably the most, uh, most obstreperous, the most pernicious predators. And in fact, some wildlife areas, recreation areas in California, the rangers have adopted a saying uh, to use with park visitors that says, um, uh, feed a jay, kill a murelet. And what they're attempting to do is to induce in, induce people to understand that by feeding uh, the, the jays and the other corvids, that that attracts them to the area. And because they're smart birds, they're going to look around. And if there are murelets nesting in the area, that's really going to increase the possibility of predation. But as it turns out, despite that high predation rate, that's really not the biggest problem uh, for the marble murelets. Um, and as I said, kind of a, a parallel path as the northern spotted owls, and it has really been a loss of nesting habitat, really pronounced in Washington over the last 20 years. Um, and the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, recent on-water survey found a 44% decline uh, in the marbled murelet population in those years. So if you have been noticing or saying to yourself or looking at your field notes and say, man, I don't see as many murelets as I used to. Well, there's a reason for that. And that's because there are far fewer on the water than there was 20 or 25 years ago. Now the birds are doing reasonably better. They're, they're holding stable in Oregon and California. 
and probably because there's a correlation of less loss of nesting habitat than there has been in Washington state. But the decline has been so steep that biologists are recommending that on the state list, uh, murelets be moved from threatened to endangered. And there's a few questions that again need to be answered uh, similarly to the questions about the spotted owl. Um, a lot of researchers believe that it's this um, uh, uh, kind of mediocre uh, habitat, uh, not great uh, connected uh, old growth habitat that is really causing the birds to decline. And if there were incentives for landowners to preserve or improve habitat, uh, tax breaks, that might be one way to preserve uh, what's left of the marble murelet hab. There's some uh, researchers are trying to do some work to see whether or not they will actually nest in second growth forests. Their ground nesters uh, way up north, uh, can they adapt uh, to nesting uh, elsewhere other than in old growth forests? That question is still on the table and we don't know. And finally, in terms of climate change, what effects will water temperature have on the forage fish uh, that these birds prey on? Uh, will that affect those populations in any kind of way that will in turn affect the marble murelet populations? So unanswered questions, again, a uh, second of the two target species tonight where the picture is not so rosy. Uh, but as we turn to the third bird, our last bird tonight, that we're gonna focus on. There is some good news here. So let's end with a good story and some good news. Uh, I do have to make a confession. Uh, this particular subspecies of bird is not actually found within the boundaries of Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, other subspecies are, but we're actually going to take a field trip onto the Nisqually Prairie to see this bird. So this is the Nisqually Prairie. You see tons of camas here in the foreground. You see the, the mountain in the background. And here's your bird of interest. Who are we looking at here? Is it A, angry bird? It sure looks angry to me. A B, American pippin? C, a Western meadowlark? Or D, horned lark? And by the way, check out the fancy bracelets on this guy. Three different bands. And answer is, of course, horned lark. And this is uh, one of the subspecies. This is a streaked horn lark, Aromophila alpestris strigata, strigata streaked. So let's get a little closer and let's dig in. So here is a streaked horn lark on the Nisqually Prairie. Uh, this is one of a couple of dozen of subspecies of horn larks. The ones that you and I see up in the mountains in the summertime uh, probably are alpini, the subspecies alpini. Uh, and they may, Alpini may uh, breed in lower uh, uh, elevations as well. But uh, the, the one that we're going to focus on is the subspecies uh, Strigata. This is a bird of the prairies, a native prairie that once stretched geez, from, from Canada to Oregon, if you can believe that. If you don't know much of the prairies, it's a fascinating story. And there's very little of the original prairie oak ecosystem left. Just a, a very small percentage of it. And most of it is down around Joint Base lewis McCord. A lot of it is actually protected uh, at Joint Base lewis McCord and in the surrounding areas. And logically, of course, when we lose a, a, a ton of habitat, we know that what that usually comes with that corresponds with a decline in biodiversity. And this has certainly been the case in the in the prairies of this region. Uh, my last check, there were 46 species of plants that had been adversely affected, either had been uh, uh, on watch lists, a threatened or endangered list at both either the state or federal level. So plants that were under siege and about half of the prairie bird species in the last hundred years have experienced either a, a population loss, a reduction in their range, or have been extirpated entirely that is made locally extinct. So really a severe impact on uh, the, the, the inhabitants of these native prairies. Uh, however, the, the story as you'll see here for the uh, streaked horn lark is, is better, better than we could hope for uh, based on the great work that is going on in some of these areas. 
So if we wanted to take a look historically, this is what's believed to be some of the original range of street torn larks uh, here in uh, southwestern BC, uh, a couple of spots on Vancouver Island, the Puget Sound region, which we are going to zero in on shortly, uh, maybe some nest sites out on the coast along the Columbia River and then down in, into the Willamette Valley. Uh, what we've got today in terms of known streaked hornlark nesting sites are a few out on the coast, a handful along the Columbia River, and what we're going to take a closer look at are some of these South Puget lowland sites. So let's dig into those and take a closer look. This is a map of Joint Base lewis McCord. Uh, those of you that are familiar with the big, big base uh, between Tacoma here, and Olympia. If you drive I-5 between those two locations, you're basically driving right through the heart of J what's called JBLM, Joint Base lewis McCord, uh, or as some folks like to call it, JBLM, Jablam. But uh, so the yellow polygons are Joint Base lewis McCord, and the uh, dark, the black polygons are known occupied streaked hornlark study sites. So there are several sites on Joint Base lewis mccord where uh, streaked hornlarks have been recorded over the last couple of years. And there are a few locations, these striped polygons where larks have not been recorded recently. And then there's also out at the um, Shelton Airport, Sanderson Airport at Shelton, there is a lark study site there and also at the Olympia Airport. Well, because we're talking about uh, a bird that's protected under the ESA, uh, obviously it's not a good idea for you and me to go looking for them uh, during the breeding season. But the best that I can offer you is a virtual field trip. So if you want to come out to the Nisqually Prairie, we can poke around a little bit and see what the biologists are up to and what kind of work they're doing to, uh, to help the street torn lark. So here we are on the Nisqually Prairie. Uh, do you see any birds? Okay, how about a helper? Do you see any birds now? Maybe. How about right in here? Do you see the little beakster here? So we got at least, there's another beak. We got at least a couple of birds. So these are birds that are ground nesters. And, and non-birders often go, oh, ground nesters, why would you do that? You know, that's that sounds like a bad idea. Well, that's the way they've evolved. You can see that the, these birds are, uh, the young are very cryptic. Uh, the, the adults are, are very particular in uh, where they construct the nest, uh, well, well hidden, and uh, even uh, with uh, some protections built in. I could talk more about that if, you, if you'd like to know. But uh, even still, uh, with those protections, they are, of course, subject to predation. Uh, they're predated on by uh, Western meadowlarks, Northern Harriers, uh, garter snakes, coyotes. Uh, here's a researcher. Why does why does this guy look so frumpy? Why does Adam look so sad? Well, let's take a close up of what he's holding in his hand, and that is a predated nest. Do you see this egg that's been cracked open, and that nest has also then been abandoned by the parents. So predation is definitely uh, an issue for these ground nesting birds, the street torn larks, but it's as we've already talked about, the loss of habitat. And one of the things that really startled biologists when they started to really look at their data was that they found that these birds had a very low hatch rate at JBLM, the streaked horn larks. They had a very low hatch rate and a very low fledging rate. Not, not many birds were being recruited into the adult population. And what they surmised was that there was probably a lack of genetic diversity, that these birds had been inbreeding, had led them to a higher susceptibility of disease, and that these nest failures and lack of fledging probably was connected to a lack of genetic diversity. So they cooked up a plan. They hatched a plan, sorry for the pun, called the Genetic Rescue Project. And actually, that's just fancy terminology for uh, uh, yeah, a, a big, a big complicated kidnapping plot is really what it amounts to. It's really what it is. So uh, these biologists at Joint Base Lewis McCord 
were in cahoots with biologists down at the Corvallis, Oregon airport, where there is a, a very healthy and robust population of streaked horn larks. And they knew that these streaked horn larks uh, could suffer or, or could sustain a, a loss of a nest up to a couple of times in a season, and they would rebuild their nests. So what they started to do when the conditions were perfect, biologists would drive from JBLM down to the Corvallis airport in the breeding season, and they would scoop up uh, a nest with eggs in it from Corvallis, put it in a, a, a plug-in incubator in the car, drive it straight away back to JBLM, and they would translocate that nest with eggs from Corvallis out into the prairie where they knew they had a pair of uh, streaked horn larks, but that had not yet built a nest. And the hope was that they could basically fool these adult birds into becoming parents to these eggs, uh, adopted parents to these eggs that they had not biologically produced. And lo and behold, it worked and it's working. So uh, this is Tremaine. She does not, that's not a pan of lasagna. She's not going to a picnic. That is one of the plug-in incubators. She has just returned early morning drive down to Corvallis and gotten back to JBLM. And here's what's inside. A clutch of streaked horned lark eggs. I think they average three to five eggs is about the average clutch size. Here's the award-winning uh, clutch. This is not from the eggs that you just saw in that incubator. Look at all these little fluff balls. How many birds are in here? Let's see if we can find how many are in here. Let's count the beaks. One, two, three, four, five, six. I got six beaks. So this was a super healthy uh, female that produced just a, a, a bumper crop clutch of six birds. So before we wrap things up, I want to be sure to introduce you to Brian. Notice Brian's of fancy bands. He's got two on each leg. He is what they call one of the rock stars of the entire project. He was a he was an egg. He started out as an egg in Corvallis. He was translocated up to JBLM. He hatched, he fledged, and has returned to Joint Base Lewis McCord several years to breed. And so here is the genetic diversity being affected in a good way by an outside bird with a, a, a different genetic makeup coming and living and now spreading that amongst the population at JBLM. So that's some really good news. And there's more good news for the larks at JBLM. Not only did the biologists pull off the kidnapping plot in the genetic rescue project, but they have also worked with the managers at Joint Base Lewis McCord to do some really groundbreaking cool stuff on behalf of the birds. This is my friend Adrian Wolf. He's got a nestling here that they're probably just taking a look at, maybe taking some data off of. But one of the things they've done is they've started on the ground nest finding where they get crews of people out walking the grounds in the spring to find where there are nests of street torn larks. And when they do, they get the GPS coordinates, they communicate that to the people at base who plan the training operations, who plan, uh, who, who, who work with, with, the, uh, with the airplanes, and they have made arrangements to actually uh, uh, avoid those areas where nests are known. And so that has reduced some of the impacts on the birds to such an extent. Look at this increase at the airfield They've gone from eight pairs up to 50, over six-fold increase in the last nine years. Pretty good stuff. And on the native prairie, they've seen an increase in 10 years from 12 to 40 pairs on the JBLM native prairie sites. So that's some really good news. They're working with people to uh, uh, inform them and uh, people are responding and they're also changing the mowing regime so they don't just accidentally mow over nests if they know where they are they can now avoid them so the news is not all great because uh, off base there aren't a lot of conservation measures that are in place yet in fact uh, there are still decreasing numbers at olympia and at the shelton airports uh, department of fish and wildlife the state uh, continues to work with those airport owners in an attempt to help them adapt 
and, and understand and to adopt some of the same practices that are making such a good difference on the grounds at JBLM. So as we wrap up the talk, why don't we just take a look at a, a, a couple of questions for each of our three target species, just as a way to maybe kind of land on what I think are maybe some of the big ideas. So here's two questions about northern spotted owls. This first one is true and false. Uh, northern spotted owls are declining at Mount Rainier, but are doing well in other portions of their range. Is that true or false? That's the bad news. That's a false. The second one is multiple choice. Uh, the two key factors in the decline of northern spotted owls are, is it A, loss of old growth habitat, B, poaching by hunters, C, competition from barred owls, or D, lack of prey. So we're looking for two factors that have really been instrumental in their decline. And they are A, loss of old growth habitat, and C, competition from barred owls. All right, next bird. Let's take a look at the marble murelets. A couple of questions. Uh, marble murelets appear to be the only alcid that nests in old growth, or if you want to expand and say one of the only at, at, to prove it for sure that there are others. Uh, but marble murelets appear to be one of the only alcids that nest in old growth forests. Uh, true or false? Uh, so far as uh, we know, true. Multiple choice, marble murelet numbers may improve with two elements. A, breeding programs, train the birds to have larger clutches. Chuckle, chuckle. B, landowners can be persuaded to preserve habitat. C, predator removal programs, begin and succeed. Or D, murelets can adapt to nesting in second growth forests. So we're looking for two things that we've talked about in the presentation that could have a good impact. Those are B, landowners preserve habitat, and D, murelets adapt to nesting in second growth forests. Okay, let's wrap it up with the larks. Streaked-horned larks are just one of many prairie bird species impacted by habitat loss, true or false. Uh, bad news is that's true. And finally, the multiple choice. All of these factors contribute to the lark's recovery except one. It is A, increasing the frequency of mowing. B, the Oregon Nest Translocation Project. C, nest finding and other conservation measures. D, communicating nest locations to airfield managers. So all of these are to the lark's benefit except one. What would that be? That would be A, increasing the frequency of mowing. Okay, so as we move into the question uh, and answer period, I've got just a couple of public service announcements for you. Uh, if you're interested in the book, that's great. Uh, it, it's widely available. If you want to support your local bookstore, uh, they either have it or they can get it for you. Uh, you can also get it from me, my website, or you can get it online. Uh, lots of great stories there, and uh, lots of lots of love to the Park Service for just uh, so many researchers sharing their research world with me and welcoming me into the field with them. Uh, also, I want to make sure you know that I've got a couple of other talks uh, th that are, are different in, in their... I, I don't think they're that bad either. They're pretty good. Uh, kind of the flagship talk is to home as big as stories. And what I unpack there is uh, the presence of native people at Mount Rainier that stretches back over 9,000 years. And we didn't know any of this 50 or 60 years ago. This is all relatively recent information. Over 100 archaeological finds at different locations at Mount Rainier. Really a fascinating story. And again, the park invited me to participate in a few different digs and I learned so much from the park archaeologist. And the other big story is, of course, the effects of climate change at Mount Rainier that extend far beyond uh, the retreating glaciers, which most folks are familiar with. But there's tons of other effects of climate change that are going on at Mount Rainier and elsewhere in the Alpine uh, high country, regionally and around the world, for that matter. So that's the home as big as stories. 
And then I know most of you probably don't live in the Nisqually River watershed, or you might not even know when you were in the Nisqually River watershed, but starting at the Nisqually Glacier and the Nisqually River going down through places like uh, LB in, in Eatonville and past Graham and emptying out into, uh, well, one of yours and my favorite locations, Billy Frank Jr. in Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge, right? We love that place. Um, that's where it empties out. This is just an amazing set of stories about the restoration and the preservation projects that have been in play in the watershed for decades. Really fascinating, great partnerships and great work. And I, that's, those are the sorts of things that I highlight in this virtual field trip in the Nisqually River watershed. So uh, with that, I sure thank you for hanging in there with me. I'm going to stop my sharing. Oh, there's a shot of the uh, of the Nisqually Glacier and where the river begins. That's where we start the talk. And we end the, for the field trip, of course, down at the refuge. Okay. Bravo, bravo, Maybe. bravo. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for lifting the curtain on the mysteries, you know, around the breeding and the, and the lives of uh, these target birds that so many of us would love to see. Oh my goodness. And certainly enjoyed the photographs. And Good, thank you research and all the work that has gone into it. And it, I'm guessing Elaine has been gathering questions while they were, uh, they were as your talk was proceeding. Well, uh, may I say, number one, Jeff, it is so clear that you are an outstanding educator. I mean, making us take a quiz and then making sure we actually absorb something. Those are the best methodologies. <laughs> <laughs> and and for all of you out there, we also recognize that dear Jeff is a much better Zoom user than any of us, maybe all of us put together. <laughs> and so he is also able to look at the chat questions. I'd be very yeah. glad to read them, Jeff, if you uh, would prefer. I, 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 I'm just going to start at the top and just kind of work my way down. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy doing if that. If you start at the one that says Northern Spotted Owl question at 7.56 p.m., that's the first question. All right. Let's see if I can get to that pretty easy. Right after the smiley yeah. face. Yeah. It, uh, has it been possible to collect DNA? This is from Elaine's question. Has it been possible to collect DNA in order to evaluate the genetics of these small, rather isolated Northern Spotted Owl populations? Um, yes, I do believe. Uh, that they they are now uh, collecting DNA samples. We didn't do it uh, when I was with the survey crew, and that was about 2012. So I'm sorry, Elaine, I can't give you a straight answer as to where they're doing it. I just know that um, that has become DNA sampling has become more and more something that, I, and I've seen uh, other biologists working on other species do it. So I imagine that they do it with northern spotted owls, but I just don't know what the genetics are like or what that's telling them about those populations. So that would be a good thing for me to find out for the next talk. Thank you very much. That was a very straight answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just couldn't help you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tracy Bell. All right, here I come. What is your estimate for how many spotted owls are left in Mount Rainier National Park? Mm. Let's see. At that. So when I was in the field, and it's been some, it was some years, um, and, and, and it varies uh, from year to year based on the conditions. And is it they're only, are they only an even year breeder? One year, they're easier to survey and find than another year. Um, but that particular year that I was with the crew, there was only a handful of birds that they had verified at Mount Rainier. And I mean, so th they knew there was a pair uh, outside of Longmire near Eagle Peak. There had been one lone bird uh, kind of patrolling and calling the uh, around the Longmire area. There had been a pair up to Homa Creek. So really, it was just no more than a couple of handfuls at that time. And I just don't know currently what they've got in terms of the numbers. But it's not, it's it, it's not going to be a lot, right? Right. Yeah. 
the next question by Sally is uh, actually one of those basic ones that maybe it would be good for you to uh, review. You covered so much great material, but this is kind of the basis. What is it about barred owls that is impairing spotted owls? She asks, is, it, is are they killing spotted owls or are they competing for the same food? They're out competing them. So they, they basically are moving into, and thank you for your question, Sally, by the way. So basically what the biologists see in, in what they have evidence is, is that because the barred owls are so highly adaptive, they can move right into spotted owl territory. And because they're bigger and th they can uh, be more productive because they have a wider uh, prey uh, sources so they can just move in and out compete the, the northern spotted owls and the spotted owls move out of the territory and until the barred owls are removed and then the spotted owls they have evidence that the spotted owls return yeah that's so it's, it's competition so important and i think jeff maybe you can speak to another factor which i think we've read a bit about about the spotted owl seems to need such a larger territory and what we've cut up in the forestry areas have made it more possible for barred owls to do their thing how big is twenty five thousand acres that sounds like a pretty big hunk of land they use twenty five thousand acres as their as their food finding range and then they are as we all know they are a bird of the old growth forest so otherwise they're dealing with patchwork uh habitat so yeah you're right they have a huge need in terms of a, a, a large area for their, uh, for their range. We now move to the marvelous marbled merlet. And Noel asked, do owls predate on merlets? We have a no, theme going. <laughs> I don't have any information or any evidence of that at all, Noel. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting proposition, but uh, so like great horned owls, we know what a tough customer they are, right? Uh, but I don't. I just don't know, and I haven't seen anything in the literature that indicates um, most of the predation, as I said, comes from the corvids. And um, let's see, what were the others? Some of the mammals might have been pine martin, you know, and some of the others, uh, four legged, uh, you know, that are that are carnivores in the forest that predate on your lats. But no evidence of owl predation that I've come across. I had a string of two questions about marble burlesque, if you if you could uh, take them, please. Uh, yeah. With marvelous advances towards tinier and better better transmitters, has that technology been brought in to study marble burlets? Well, I would sure uh, uh, imagine so. The the last book that I read was by Maria Mudd, and and oh, she yeah. yeah, and I believe that they use transmitters on birds. Now, interestingly, um, there's no research being done on marble murelets at Mount Rainier National Park right now. So what the park did was they determined, they did some studies in the 90s. It's been 15 years or more since I think they've done any marble murelet studies. They determined where the, where the murelets were. They were not really super interested in learning uh, if they were nesting or where they were nesting, but they, they documented the presence of marble murelets and they wanted to make sure that they were within the federal standards for uh, like noise. So if they were to bring in equipment to do work, they wanted to make sure that they were observing the fish and wildlife regulations for having the noise be below a certain threshold. And when they determined that, then they Park said basically they're good. So even a few years ago, when I proposed a citizen science project to have people stationed to see if we could locate uh, marble murelet nest sites, at that point, the Park said, really, we're not interested. We don't really want to draw attention to them if they are nesting. And so thanks anyway. So good enough. Right. Uh let me ask uh, if we can jump back to spotted owls. We have two questions on spotted owls that came in. Um, do they migrate? And if so, where do they go? They are non-migratory, I do believe. If anybody has more information on that, please speak up. But my, yeah. under my understanding is the spotted are non-migratory. And have spotted owls been found near Longmire? Yes. Yeah, and I have I've hooted for them with park biologists just on the road, 
just driving between, like if you're familiar with the Couch Creek picnic area is on up into Longmire. We we weren't lucky. We didn't get any, but there have been evidence of them, and they have um, heard spotted owls in the Longmire area, which is partly crazy because you think, well, that's a developed area, but it's also, you know, old growth is within spitting distance, right, of, of, of the Longmire area. That's a great, great clue that uh, they've maintained uh, more of the old growth near the uh, lodges and so on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my other question was, would you be able to help us? I mean, I bet some of us also were concerned, a little chagrined to hear that they were doing better in Oregon and California when it came to habitat loss. What is it about us? What factors in Washington are not so supportive of that? Uh, well, my my research indicated that it was um, it was a difference in in the in the volume of land that had been old growth land that had been logged. Even though the Northwest Forest Plan curtailed much of that, there's still been uh, substantial logging of old growth in Washington compared to what had been logged off in Oregon and California. So that's what what I deduced, what my research showed me was that the, the reason was directly related to more loss of old growth forest in Washington than in Oregon and California. Excellent. Yeah. Well, if anyone wants to ask a question, please go for it. But oh. here's one from Chin Lin. She wants yeah. to know, where to find white-tailed ptarmigan, and he wonders if spotted owl share the same habitat with marbled merlet. We kind of know that they're not quite, but there's some overlap, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. And where and when most likely to find white-tailed ptarmigan, like I said at the beginning, if you recall, they, they seem like a bird that I don't find, they find us. And if you're going to sunrise, uh, you're going to the right place. Do you have a, can you go and camp at the White River Campground and spend a week just walking the trails in August? Uh, my best luck in the last 10 or 15 years to see ptarmigan has been on some of the most common trails. But if I get a pretty good early start, I'll get out there before uh, everybody else has made a bunch of noise and scared everything off. So the trails that go up to like Burroughs Mountain, uh, I've had good luck. Uh, and it's only luck, you know, uh, finding uh, white-tailed ptarmigan there uh, around the frozen lake area as well, uh, further on out uh, toward uh, Skyscraper Pass. So you're in the right you're in the right area, and it's just a matter of spending tons of time out there and getting lucky. I don't have any other formula other than that. And when people ask, how do I see spotted owls? It's basically the same idea. Go to the right kind of habitat. So, um, you know, they have been they have been found in recent years in the Longmire area. We know that spotted owls and marble murelets uh, both uh, both breed in old growth forests. So, the more time that you and I are able to spend in those old growth forests at the right time of year right? And at the right time of day. So we want to be there when in the summertime during their breeding season, when we've got the best chance of hearing spotted owls or murelets. And so, and, and again, the best time of day, uh, in the case of the, of the murelets, if I wasn't going up there at three or four o'clock in the morning, I probably would have never detected a murelet. So again, spotted owls, they're most active a couple hours before sunrise and a couple hours after, because they're nocturnal, right? So look, trying to find, for me to find a spot at all, I'm going to have to, you know, adapt to their hours. I'm going to have to be real early before or later in the day, a couple hours after sunset. Right. As uh, we Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff, I have a quick question. We had a birding friend from Australia who really wanted to see ptarmigan, and we got up early and got to sunrise early. Yeah. And we were up on Burroughs Mountain, yeah. and here came a prairie falcon. Oh, yes. Was it, so, was, it, was it August or September? Uh, it was early August. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so at that point, we stopped looking. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, later, there, there actually was a researcher at the park who was studying the street horned larks, and we saw him in the parking lot a couple of hours later, and sure enough, 
he had seen a couple of ptarmigan oh. um, after the, you know, we waited for a while, but with the prairie falcons there. So are the prairie falcons impacting the ptarmigan population? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I do see prairie falcons most late August in September, just one bird or two birds a season. I, I really don't. And again, I'd be really interested to see more work on the status of the ptarmigans and what people are attributing their, you know, their decline to. Um, I haven't seen anything that indicates that uh, it's predation by uh, prairie falcons that has led to this concern. Okay, thank you. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning the streaked horned lark because we need to include that bird. As we turn that way, may I mention that I have pasted Jeff's website and his Facebook place into the chat if anyone wants to click on those hyperlinks. Uh, question, after translocating a nest with eggs to JBLM, do the adopting parent birds add their own eggs? Man, you have the best questions. I'm well, sorry. It, it are... wouldn't be very helpful if they just raised the ones that were there and they didn't add any of their own. Then that doesn't. <laughs> no, no, ev no evidence that they add their own because oh. you, you, they basically are getting tricked. So, boom, here's a full clutch. And the researchers have done all their homework to know where they have a pair of birds that are ready uh, to nest. They haven't built a nest yet. Or maybe they've had a fail. Mm. Right, they've had a nest that's been predated on. They take out the predated nest, they put in another one, and no, I don't have any information that the birds add their own eggs. They just raise the translocated ones. Excellent. Yeah. Paula wants to know where to access other talks that you mentioned. Would that be on your website? Mm -hmm. um, well, some of the talks to other groups are on YouTube. I know that. Oh. So, so you could you could just um, probably do a YouTube search. Um, I, I I usually keep an up to date list of upcoming talks, and usually they're open to the public. Uh, and um, so if and I've I've been a little remiss the, the last couple of months, uh, haven't kept an updated list of my talks. But um, for example, I have a talk coming up. Uh, in May for uh, the Marysville Parks Department, and that will be a virtual field trip for uh, the Nisqually Watershed. So uh, a short answer, Paula, if you wanted to contact me uh, through my website, I could help you get connected to some of the other talks. Or if you're connected to a group that would be interested, I'd be happy to, you know, talk with folks and help set things up. So. Uh, maybe just contacting me directly, Paula, might be the best way to help you get connected. Thank you for your interest. We have two other nicely curated sitting, uh, let's see, they're, they're mellowing questions. And if anyone else has any, uh, start typing. <laughs> uh, Dan wonders if you have an estimate for the number of boreal owls and white-tailed ptarmigan. I don't. And are there any cougars in Mount yes. Rainier? Yes, 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 there are. Uh, so I don't have an estimate for the number of boreal owls or what tail term again. Um, so no, I, I, I don't know. Um, my a history with cougars in the park uh, is uh, pretty spotted. I, I think if you wanted, um, I always think that one of the, the one of the, the the best places to be for cougar is way up the west side road, because there's so rarely anybody up there, and um, I I've never I've not seen a cougar in that part of the park, but um, I think that you know when you think of cougars you want to think of places where you know there aren't people, and that west side road. And I've been up there a few times, like on a bicycle, you can get way up the road and um, uh, ne I never have seen a cougar, but that I think that would be a, a great place to just, I always keep my eyes open. Well, we got to ask, we got to ask Dan if he wanted to see one or he just wanted to be sure he wasn't where we were. <laughs> <laughs> he probably wants to see one. <clears throat> yeah. Randy's <laughs> last question here is, if spotted owls return after barred owl control, might they just become quiet and thereby be undetected by the BADOs. 
I, you know, I, I just, do, I just don't know, Randy. That I mean, they probably don't have a volume control, you know, on there. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but when you think about it, I mean, you know, the barred owls are removed, the spotted's return. They're going to be there until they are, you know, infiltrated again by, presumably by barred owls or by the, or some other something else that causes this the spotted owls to you know to die or to leave the area so i don't think um and and when and when you realize that you know that's part of their breeding behavior is to hoot and to mark their territory um i think that that's probably you know just the, the way that it's going to be now you raise an interesting question. How is it? It's it's not that. It's not that uh, barred owls know that spotted owls are there. It's that barred owls have moved into an area where spotted owls have just happened to be, and then they've gone about their own business that results in their outcompeting the spotted owls. Huh, I hadn't really thought about that much. Boy, you folks have asked the best questions tonight. I think you've stumped me on more questions than I've been able to answer. <laughs> oh, because you've inspired such curiosity. <laughs> well, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, are there any other final questions? Well, oh. I would I would like to volunteer. I mentioned earlier with the uh, generous permission of the speaker and uh, Elaine's hard work that this presentation will be at the WAS YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, probably. And if you want to share it with someone or see it a second time, that would be your opportunity. And I would certainly like to thank you, Jeff. This has just been a wonderfully uh, informative and interesting talk. And I love Good. the visuals and everything we learned and Good. really appreciate your sharing your your uh, expertise and all, all that you've learned at Mount Rainier and about these wonderful birds. Thank you. It's It's been a real pleasure.